I started to use artificial sweeteners. And then it was just like this slippery downhill slope. Mentally, that harmed me exponentially because it just led me to binging now on keto foods, which completely defeated the purpose of what I was doing. I struggled to wipe my own butt. At 360 pounds, I struggled. It felt like I had to like almost dislocate my own arm to do it. The day that I did it without effort, I cried. These are the things that have pulled me out of my depression. I had gotten to the point with my anxiety and my depression that I wouldn't leave the house for months at a time. I was so anxious. I would have panic attacks. I get comments like that on my channel all the time. Like, you're going to die of a heart attack or a stroke. And it's like, I was two steps away from that where I was at nine months ago. What are you, are you kidding me? Okay, folks, good morning, everybody. Hope everybody's having a, a nice Friday here. We have a special guest today. Amanda's joining us, and she's going to tell us about her success story here. So thanks for doing this. Um, let me ask you, just where are you located in the world? What part of the... I'm in Bellingham, Washington. Oh, wow. You're not... You know, I'm in Snohomish, Washington, which is... Uh, I, I drove through Bellingham like last week. I was on my way up. I, mm -hmm. I had to go to Vancouver for a little business trip. And uh, uh, so I, I know exactly where you are. So awesome to, awesome to have you. Uh, I've been following. I think, I think it's you on Twitter. You've had, you've, you've been, you've been posting on Twitter about your your weight loss journey and your health journey, and it's really it's inspiring to see. And uh, I'm sure the other people have seen have been pretty pretty impressed by what you've been able to do. So let me just start by just getting a little bit of background information. I talked about you know how you grew up and how you got into the situation you're in, and 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 we'll talk about how you're hopefully fixing all that stuff. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. I was an average weight as a kid. I look back at pictures of myself and it wasn't until I was about nine or 10 that I started to gain weight. And I just had some traumatic things happen as a child. And I, my parents weren't aware of what happened. And I watched my mom be a size four and eat an entire bag of Hershey's to deal with her emotions. So as I got older, I kind of learned, oh, that is how you deal with your feelings. That is how you deal with the negativity in life is eating. And you can see in pictures from when I was nine to then when I was 12, I was gaining weight and gaining weight. And my weight just kind of went up from there. I was a late bloomer because I had polycystic ovarian syndrome, which I was diagnosed when I was 16. I actually had to have one of my, I had my left ovary removed when I was 18 because of a large cyst. And the weight, you know, I have it probably around 220s for most of my late teen years and my early 20s. I kind of got over what happened as a kid, but then life, you know, as an adult, it's not what you think it's going to be trial, tribulations, and then just the honestly, the depression, anxiety from just becoming overweight. I have tried every single diet you could ever imagine from, you know, whole foods to veganism to my brother convinced me to do white boiled potatoes for a few months just to lose weight. I, I've just done keto. I did it all. And yeah, so I struggled pretty much for the past, I'm 33 now. So 20 years of my life, dieting, gaining, losing, gaining, losing. I actually have a background in physical therapy. I've been doing physical therapy for 10 years. I don't actually see patients anymore. And that was because of the huge deterioration in my health and my mental health that led me to stop seeing patients about two years ago when we moved up from Arizona to up here. And yeah, so, I mean, that's just kind of the genesis of how I got where I got. Honestly, one bite at a time, one not so great health choice at a time. And yeah. Yeah. It's, well, I'm, I'm glad you point out because a lot, a lot of, you know, people eat for really non- non-nutritive reasons. We, we, sometimes we eat out of emotion, eat out of comfort, eat out of boredom, eat out of social pressures and a lot of things that, that go on. And it's very easy to do. I mean, it's certainly, you know, it's like just mindlessly sitting in front of the TV and eating a bag of potato chips or something like that. It's something that probably all of us have done at one point or, or most of us have. And it's, it's, you know, like I said, it's not, we don't need to do that, obviously. Um, you said you were you were two twenties. You know, by the time you were, I guess, in your teens or something. Like that. What would do you know? What your peak weight you got up to? How what was your heaviest? Or do you you know? Uh, in my twenties, the heaviest I got up to was like two forty six. My heaviest overall in my life was three hundred and sixty pounds. That's where I started at when I started carnivore. Wow, three sixty. Okay. Um, yeah, I just got to mention. I just I was just looking at a. I was just on my social media on Twitter, and there's a gal in Arizona who was in a nursing home at 
five, I think she was about five fifty, and now she's down to three seventy. So she's same thing, carnivore diet, you know, and it's it's just amazing to see. Um, so you know, you tried all these diets over the what polycystic ovarian syndrome, you know, which is becoming more and more common, you know, and and, and so there's a lot of thought that it's related to insulin resistance. And, you know, sometimes they put people on metformin for that, uh, you know, to kind of, I mean, recognize some of that physiology. Um, what other, you, you said mental health took a deterioration. Do you, were you formally diagnosed with a number of different conditions or, or what was what was going on besides just being overweight? What other issues did yeah. you have? I, I've actually been on and off antidepressants since I was 12 years old. They clinically, um, I was clinically depressed. And so, you know, here I am 12 years old taking antidepressants. And I imagine that probably didn't help with my weight issue either. Uh, so I started off with PCOS. By the time I, had, I was 18 and had that left ovary removed, I started having a lot of pain issues or just notice. And I remember going to my primary care and saying, you know, doc, I, I feel like a 70 year old. I'm 18 and my joints hurt, my hands hurt, the my clothes touching my skin, all this. And he kind of just laughed at me and did some blood work. And my dad ended up sending me to the Mayo Clinic in Arizona because at the time I didn't, I lived on the other side of the country. And they thought I had lupus. I really didn't do anything about it because I'm just like, they're going to put you on prednisone. They're going to stick you on steroids and I'm already fat enough. So let's, I just ignored it for a handful of years. Then it got so bad that I went back when I moved to Arizona with my husband they finally diagnosed me and they got a little more advanced in their tests. I have scleroderma, RA, and fibromyalgia. Although for me, fibromyalgia is kind of a catch-all. They don't really know what to diagnose it with, so you have fibromyalgia. Uh, so I have three autoimmune things going on. I was pre-diabetic most of my teenage life and into my 20s. I actually was not fully type 2 diabetic until probably my late 20s fatty liver. It got to the point where I had tinea versicolor, which is like a fungal skin growth. It's just overgrowth of yeast on the skin that got way out of control. Lipidemia, I started having like, they're like, this feels like pearls underneath the skin from just uneven, you know, disposition or deposits of fat on the body. Oh God, the list. I had 16 comorbidities when I started this. Wow. Well, that's, and that's a, that's a tough, you know, I, I can see where even if even if you didn't have uh, the, the biology for depression, I can see how that would be you know, kind of a depressing, yeah. depressing existence. To be honest, I mean, let me yeah. let me ask you. Um, you know, you said you've been on these diets, and obviously you've seen a lot of physicians if you've had all these health mm -hmm. di diagnoses. And you're and you're kind of right. Fibromyalgia, they just kind of throw it in there, and then they throw you on some antidepressants and say, you know, we don't know what causes that type of thing. That's typically how a lot of a lot of it is treated, but. During that time, you know, what were the, what were the interventions that the physicians were willing to do? Did they, did they talk to you about, I mean, I'm, I'm sure they talked to you about losing weight. I mean, I, I can't imagine they didn't, but did they give you any good plans or what were the, what were the, what was the typical advice that you got? Uh, metformin was the first thing for the PCOS. The, it was actually an OB that, or a gyno that diagnosed me. He said, this will help with the weight. It didn't really do much with anything. The biggest thing I was told is eat less, move more. It was probably the number one thing. They sent me to nutritionists, but the nutritionists were low fat, high carb. And I just was hungry all the time doing it. I mean, hungry all the time. My only blessing, I think in my later teen years and early twenties is I was helping remodel houses. So I literally was digging post holes and moving dirt around. And I think that's the only thing that really kept my weight down is I was very physically active. Other than that, the best success I had prior to carnivore is I actually went and saw a nutritionist myself. I found one and I remember her telling me, she said, everything she learned in school was absolute trash. She said she got out of school, started treating her diabetic patients and even herself with this, you know, low fat, high carb, and they just got sicker. She said she had to do a lot of learning and searching and continuing education. She found Low carb was absolutely the best method to deal with people. I had pretty decent, I had actually pretty good success on that. I lost like 40 pounds, but it still did not address the mental component of the binge eating for me. And that has been the game changer with doing carnivore is from keto to carnivore is it completely makes me address that binge eating I have. 
Yeah, and that's a good point. I'll, I'll get to that. I think that's a, that's such a such a really important mm-hmm. part that, that we talk about. Um, you said you tried veganism for a while. I mean, a lot of people, mm-hmm. a lot of people would you know would see you on social media and and still tell you, well, a whole food plant based diet is going to be better. Anyone, you can lose weight on any diet. Just a caloric deficit. Uh, why are you eating? Because you know veganism saves all the animals and saves the planet, which I of course don't agree with. But what was your experience with a, with a vegan diet? I remember being hungry all the time, trying to figure out what, because I don't, I don't like beans. I never have how to make myself eat these things. I did not want to eat. I felt like I had to eat all the time because I just couldn't seem to get enough in me. Yeah. Okay. And, and, uh, and any improvements in weight or any of these conditions that you were dealing with when you were doing that? I lost a little bit of weight, but I just couldn't seem to make myself eat. The autoimmune stuff, it did not help, actually. It made me feel worse. I think it just was just a huge stressor on the body because I went from thinking about food a lot to I had to think about food all the time, and that was just a huge stress for me. I, I do think things like the oxalate and the vegetables were not agreeable to me at all because it got to the point where I had a hard time waking up in the morning opening my hands. Like I, It was like someone with severe RA very like a lot of arthritis i just couldn't open my hands in the mornings till i ran them under hot water and tried to move them around when i was doing the veganism yeah it's interesting you know and 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 you mentioned rheumatoid arthritis and you know even even with osteoarthritis you know a lot of people get it in their hands and people will say well you know it's just too much weight and it's wearing out your knees i'm like what about your hands you don't walk on your hands so why are you Mm -hmm. why are we getting why are we getting inflammation and, and joint damage in our hands, which are not really impacted by how much we weigh, to be honest? And it's really a lot of biology. You know, we're seeing that more and more that our that our biology, you know, what's going on metabolically affects all our joints, including our non-weight bearing joints like our neck and our and our hands and things of that nature. Were you ever offered like, I mean, because a lot of people that get into this morbid obese category, they're taught they're, they're talked to about gastric bypass procedures, you know, gastric sleeves, you know, bariatric surgery. Um, mm-hmm. you know, dr- drug treatments and things like, was that ever proposed to you or thought about at any point? Yes. When I was 17, my dad offered to pay for it. Mm-hmm. And I went as far as doing all the nutritional classes. The last thing I had to do was schedule. And I backed out because I'm just like, I do not want to do surgery. Surgery freaked me out. And then I went through it myself when I was probably about 23. I'm like, I think I need to do this. I'm just not losing any weight. You know, I'm gaining weight. Same thing. I went through all the nutritional classes, got all the way up to the scheduled lap band. And then I backed out again because I'm like, I just, I can't do this. I had at that point knew about the autoimmune stuff and it made me very worried about them implanting a device into me. And I just have already autoimmune stuff. So I had no idea how my body would do. I ended up canceling the second time and I said, I'm not going to do it. And I just have not looked back since. Yeah, and you said you had a couple of, you said rheumatoid arthritis. I heard fibromyalgia. What was the other autoimmune issue? Scleroderma. Scleroderma. Okay. Scleroderma. Wow. That's pretty, pretty uh, significant. How, mm-hmm. how did those things affect you? Those autoimmune conditions? What can you describe what those, what was going on with you? With the autoimmune stuff? Yeah. How did that affect you? Well, other than being in constant pain at 18, it limited my life. Um, you know, in physical therapy, there's a lot of manual therapy that you have to do, which requires your hands. So it was honestly affecting my ability to treat patients because I just couldn't. You know, if I had to do any joint manipulations or things like that, I should be able to do them for 10 minutes, no problem. And I'm struggling at three minutes to be able to treat them. Doing any daily activities, <laughs> terrible. Doing the dishes, five minutes. And I just had to stop because my hands would hurt so bad. The scleroderma specifically, it had a lot of skin stuff and it just honestly, with having so many things, I tell people it's hard to know when, when where one autoimmune thing starts and the other stops for me. But the biggest thing was just the overall pain. The worst it got was literally the, just the wind blowing on my skin hurting. I mean, it, it was just excruciating like someone was holding a match to my skin. It was just terrible. I mean, the pain was just unreal. Yeah, I mean, there's some overlap between, you know, some of the symptoms of RA and scleroderma, particularly the joint, mm-hmm. joint functions. It's hard to tell when one starts, starts, mm-hmm. or stops and the other one starts, I suppose. Um, as someone, so as a physical therapist, obviously you have probably more knowledge about healthcare than, than the average person because you're, you're intimately involved and you see patients all the time and 
you see, you know, the general treatment and, you know, as an orthopedic surgeon, I, I use a lot of physical therapists for, you know, post-op care and, and times, you know, just to treat, you know, orthopedic conditions, obviously. Let me ask you, so you went keto. How did that impact these other conditions, your weight and, and all these other various, you know, medical conditions you had? It did. I did a lot better on keto. I was not having, because when I was pre-diabetic, I'd go through these episodes where I'd flush and have fluctuations in my blood sugar and feel like I'd faint. That kind of subsided and the pain got better with the autoimmune. I don't really, rem my fatty liver just has kind of gotten worse and better over the years as I've gained and lost weight and things like that. But I did see, I'd say mild to moderate improvements doing keto with the autoimmune things. But the problem is I started to use artificial sweeteners. And then it was just like this slippery downhill slope, reinventing or redoing foods that instead of having regular sugar, like oh, let's say a donut, um, even though I don't actually just surprisingly like them, but then redoing it with almond flour and stevia and all this. And it's just like mentally that harmed me exponentially because it just led me to binging now on keto foods, which completely defeated the purpose of what I was doing. Yeah. Yeah. And, that, and I think that's a real problem that people just realize a cookie is a cookie. I don't care if it's vegan, keto, paleo, it's still a cookie. And you have to realize yeah. that, that that's just not something that, that we should be eating much mm -hmm. of, if any. Uh, you know, a birthday cake should be maybe eaten on your birthday and not, you know, seven days a week, like a lot of us tend to do, you know, in some form or fashion. So how did you um, discover a carnivore diet? What what compelled you to do that? Did you think it was crazy? Did you I mean, what, what, where, where did, how did you get involved? Because like, even today, people still think, hey, carnivore is absolutely nutty. No one should do it. It's dangerous. No one can sustain it, blah, blah, blah. You know, your heart disease, scurvy, all the stuff we hear, which mostly is nonsense. Um, how did you sort of come to this conclusion to try it? My, my brother, actually, he had done carnivore for a year and a half. He always had these weird harebrained diet ideas. And he told me, he's like, at first, when he heard about carnivore, he's like, these people are nutty. He actually said he heard it from you specifically. He was like, this dude's a nut. And then he watched Michaela Peterson. He's like, I think I'm going to try this. So here I am. They, they moved back to Washington and he's like, you should try this. Well, I tried it for two weeks, but I'm being brutally honest with myself. I tried it kind of, you know, I didn't give it my all. And then I ended up in the emergency room thinking I was going to die. Like that, that was the whole, that was a precipice. Like things had to change because I was in excruciating pain. And I remember looking at my husband because my husband is, you know, 5'11". He's not, he's like 25 pounds overweight. He's not obese at all. And I remember looking at him thinking, good God, here I am wailing in pain in the emergency room. He has to drop everything to take care of me. I've been so selfish. And that when I realized that and acknowledged myself, I was putting my wants over his needs. God, it was empowering realizing, well, if I made those choices and I can make different choices. So I watched some that evening, uh, Michaela Peterson talk about her juvenile RA. And then I started thinking, okay, if the autoimmune is causing me so much pain that I'm hardly moving right now, then maybe it can help me with this plus the weight. And literally went from cake one day to carnivore the next. I mean, it, that was it. Done. Said and done. And, and when, do you remember the date or the time frame you did that when it was? June 28th, 2022. June 28th, 2022. So we're, we're not quite a year, but we're coming up to that. So probably another four, mm -hmm. four months away or so. What are we, March? Yeah, three months away. So um, so nine months in. Okay. So, and you said you said you kind of tried it for two months. What did What did you mean by that? Two weeks, rather. What did you mean by that? ate more meat. I, I think that was it. Like I ate more meat and I was like, so, this is something I, I discovered when I was in my teens and early twenties, I had that, like I'd start, started dying, and be like, yeah, I can, I can do this somewhere in my late twenties. I stopped believing in myself and I would half-heartedly do things like just being completely brutally honest. So I, when I say tried meat, like I ate a little bit more meat for one or two days and then I'd eat a piece of cake and then be like, oh, I'm going to eat more meat. And then I'd eat another piece of cake or whatever it was. And that's what I mean. Try. Like I didn't actually self-reflect the first time to really be like, okay, Amanda, 
you either give it your all or you give it your none because anything in between isn't going to work. Okay. And so, um, so June 28 comes around, you said you went from eating cake. Now let me, cause you, you said binge eating disorder, which is, which is a lot of people have issues with. Mm-hmm. Let me, how did that affect you? I mean, how, how often were you binging? I mean, were you, I mean, was it every, every couple of weeks or how frequently did that, that, did that affect you? Every few days. Every few days. Okay. Literally every few days. It had gotten to the point where I would eat, I've got a quarter to a half a cake and that would be the entire thing I would eat all day. Like I would have a piece of cake for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. No joke. Like I was absolutely eating way too much. And then if we would eat out, I would have like, let's say we went to Wendy's. I'd have two classic singles, a large fry and that I would I know there's a lot of people could eat more, but that was way, way too much food for me. And so I would binge like that all the time, all the time. And then in between binging, what did your diet look like when you're not eating cake for breakfast, lunch, and dinner? What, what, was it, what, what would, would be like a day-to-day diet for you? I would eat meat and some vegetables. Like when it wasn't the sugar binge, mm-hmm. it would be meat and vegetables because I've always loved meat. And I actually, I love like asparagus and Brussels sprouts and things like that. So I would try to cook healthy meals, lower carb. You know, I'd make Alfredo with spaghetti squash and things like that. Okay. Okay. And so you, so June 28th says, I'm going to go all in. So how did, how did that begin? What did you do? And what were the kind of the, you know, how, how did you transition? That next day, when I just decided we were going to do it, I cleaned out the refrigerator, probably took about 95% of the non-carnivore stuff out of the house. Actually, I just threw it away. I just looked at it. I'm like, if I see this as poison, then why give this to somebody else? Mm-hmm. The only things I didn't get rid of were some condiments like honey mustard and baking goods because I don't really bake anyways. I'm like, eh, why check those? Maybe somebody needs them. And we just did it. Like we already had a lot of meat and we just went to Costco, bought a crap ton of ribeyes and ground beef. And I just started eating meat. I first started off eating three meals a day with some like homemade beef jerky as snacks. And eventually I've kind of tapered down to the now I eat once, maybe twice a day. Okay. And when you, you said we did it. So uh, your husband was all in on this too. Did he decide, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to support you in hundred percent carnivore as well. He has done every single diet I've ever done. He even did the white potatoes with me. Yeah. He, he jumped right on board and said, okay, he's like, you're going to give it your all. Um, he's like, I'm going to jump right in with you. And, and so what kind of stuff did you start with? Was it, was it just straight up? you know, beef and salt water, or was it, was it a little bit bacon and eggs and a little bit more variety or how did you start? Bacon and eggs. We did, we still do use some spices. Just, I changed up the meat by changing up the spices. Mm -hmm. He loves bacon and eggs and we actually make our own bacon at home. Um, So we'd have bacon and eggs for every breakfast and then, you know, made a pot roast without any vegetables and steak hamburgers, like bunless hamburgers, and just kind of alternated between those meals. The easier, the better I found making things too complicated was. Yeah, it, it certainly, when, when things are easy, it's, it's a lot easier to execute. When you were on a ketogenic diet, were you still suffering with the binging issues? Yes. I just binged on like a, those keto ice cream bars. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't just eat one. I'd eat like three or four. Like I would absolutely binge on those. Sometimes I'd eat the whole dang box. Okay. Okay. And you said you were, so once you, you know, you, you make this transition, you go to fully carnivore, you, you're eating pretty much all animal products, save a few spices apparently. When did you start to feel like different? I mean, and when was the last time you had a, had a binging episode? I haven't binged since I started this. Wonderful. I've had, not had one binge. Is that the longest you've ever gone in your life without binging? From in my adult? entire life, yes. Oh, that's awesome. So, so you know there's yeah. something. So what, when did you notice, a, how did you notice a difference? Was there, was there something like, I just don't feel like binging anymore? When, when did that occur to you? About six months and I'm like, oh, I haven't had a binge. Okay. Like I just hadn't thought about it. But when I noticed the huge difference, honestly, was within a week. And... As of right now, I've lost I've lost 105 pounds as of this past Monday. And the weight has been huge loss, but the first week I think I lost like eight pounds. And what had happened was I was so sedentary. I was I was 32, 360 pounds, 
having to use a rollator walker because I couldn't walk more than a few hundred feet from, well, being so overweight, but also I had severe, severe low back pain, like excruciating. I would have shoved a grandma out of her chair just to sit down. It hurt so bad. Within the first week, I stopped having swelling edema in my legs. I would get up. I was, I mean, 32, I was having some urinary incontinence at night. Like, I mean, it was bad. And I look back now and I just attribute it to the massive amount of weight on my abdomen and it was pressing on my bladder, causing these issues. So within the first week, it was like huge changes. Yeah. And obviously if you, you only lost eight pounds, but you've noticed significant improvements in, in I'm, I'm assuming back pain, joint pain. Is that, is that fair to say? Pain took about four weeks. The joint pain started feeling better. Not having to, like just small things got easier. My clothes got looser and I just started to feel better. I was a bit afraid of, cause I'd done to keto before and like the keto flu or the carb withdrawal flu. I, I did experience that pretty rough, but I slept a little bit better the first week. I, my GERD, oh God, I had terrible GERD. Oh Lord. It was so bad that I would actually aspirate at night. And then my airway would close up. I'd like sit up and my airway would close up because it, my body was trying to protect itself from choking on my own vomit. Mm. That went away within two weeks. But the first week I was like, holy crap, this is so much better. You know, often on a diet, we think about, you know, counting calories, restricting, you know, did you do any of that when you went to carnivore? Or did you just say, I'm just going to eat whenever I feel like it? Or how did that go for you? I started with, I'm just going to eat whatever, like as long as it's me, I'm not going to stress about it. Every other diet I've ever done, it is about portion control. It is about restricting what you're eating. And I realized the more desperate I got to lose weight, the more I restricted, but then it made me more hungry. And then it led to a binge. Like it was just this terrible cycle. And I realized that was the problem. So in the beginning I said, you know what, let's just get used to eating this way before I even consider the volume I'm eating. Yeah. Good for you. And that's what I tell people, particularly people that are struggling mm -hmm. with food addictions and things like that. that you just got to get used to eating toward, I mean, tell me about, I mean, you, you said like vegan diet and other diets, you were always hungry. You never felt like you could get full. Did you find, ever find a, now find a sense of satiety or like, Hey, I'm, I'm, I actually feel pretty good from eating. Is that, was that something you noticed differently? Oh, huge with carnivore. I didn't start with tons of fat, like, cause now I add butter to my ribeye. <laughs> every time huge because to eat 3000 calories easy easy in in a carb sugar like meal easy peasy to eat 3000 in calories in meat like I, once i hit 15 1600 calories or you know right about there i'm like oh god i'm so full i can't i cannot absolutely make myself eat anymore i'm going to vomit and i think that was a huge difference is the amount of energy i was consuming was exponentially less because i would get so full so easily on what I was eating. Yeah, it's it's interesting because I'm sure you're you're probably aware there's there's a, a you know in recent times some drugs have come out GLP one agonists which act on satiety in, in a similar way to what we see with, with what I see with meat is that it that it, <laughs> that it provokes and we know we know we know from it, from uh, studies on that that things like protein and fat particularly stimulate these in Cretan hormones to provide a sense of satiety. So you're doing it without the drugs uh, and you're getting the same sense of satiety and it's making you not want to binge eat and you just, you, you just get full easier. So it's kind of a, kind of neat to see how that physiology plays out. You know, meals are you, twice a day, once a day. What's your, what's your frequency look like for you? Now I eat about once a day. Mm -hmm. I eat a ribeye once a day. <laughs> That's all I eat. I pretty much, I, I do intermittent fasting unintentionally. Mm -hmm. I eat four to five in the afternoon and then I don't eat till four or five the next day. I just am not hungry. We've added racquetball and weightlifting the past few weeks. So I find that some days I am wanting two meals a day and we'll have bacon and eggs or I'll just eat some eggs mm -hmm. for breakfast and then we'll have some kind of beef. I also find I'm, I'm, I'm wanting beef more than anything else. Yeah, it's kind of funny how that does that. Now, you know, as somebody who's been doing this for now on my seventh year doing this, I, that's what I want. And in fact, I've got I've got a couple of New York strips waiting for me for, for a little bit later this morning. Do you find that, um, well, I mean, how about negative symptoms? Did you have a lot of negative issues? Because a lot of people say, well, it's going to be constipating. You're going to have 
I don't know. There's a lot of things that say there there, there tends to be a problem. Did any problems transitioning or even today? Before I started carnivore, I would oscillate between having constipation and diarrhea. Like I just, it was a constant battle with my GI tract. My first five weeks of carnivore were hellacious. Oh my goodness. The diarrhea was absolutely terrible, but logically I knew why it was happening. My body was not used to the amount of fat and protein. And then I was also starving my gut bacteria for the carbs and sugar had been used to. So it was kind of cleaning everything out. Five weeks, normal. I had a couple bouts of constipation and I discovered what it was is I wasn't drinking enough water and I wasn't eating enough fat. So as long as I have enough fat and water, I have no problems. Fair enough. It sounds like from age 12 through, I don't know when, 30s, you were frequently seeing physicians and, and in the healthcare mm -hmm. system for medications and issues and ER visits, things like that. Since you've gone carnivore, have you gone back to the physician? Have you, are you still engaged in that stuff or, the, or do they know what you're doing or how is it, how has that been? The whole, I started my YouTube channel two weeks into doing carnivore and I decided that with all the pain and misery of my weight had been that I could use it for some good. And I have meticulously tracked my journey from the start. I saw my physician, I believe, when, uh, two weeks, 30 days into starting carnivore. And I told him what I was going to do. And he was a bit like, you're crazy. Like he didn't say that and he didn't roll his eyes, but I could tell. And him and I kind of went around and he said, fine, if you take a multivitamin, I'll, I'll watch you do this. But you have to agree if things start to turn south, you'll quit. I said, okay, fine. I will agree to that. I'll take the multivitamin. I will stop if things go bad. I go back actually every three months to see him. And he was concerned because my cholesterol, you know, my triglycerides were 343 when I started my cholesterol. I don't even remember what it was, but it was high. So he was like, oh, okay, we're going to send you to a cardiologist because, you know, saturated fat, it's bad for you. And I went, mm, gosh, a few weeks after that to see this cardiologist. And I remember going in the office. I'm like, I'm just going to be straight up with him. I don't care if he's going to be PO'd. This is my health. This is my choice. And I remember him sitting down. And I told him, I'm like, okay. He's like, why are you here? He's like, I don't really see any heart conditions. I'm like, I don't. My PCP was afraid because I said, I'm doing carnivore, that my cholesterol is high. And he looked at me and he smiled and he's like, really? And I said, yeah. He's like, tell me what you eat. So I did. And he's like, I actually do keto for. I'm like, really? And he's like, yes. He said, my mind has been slowly changed over the past few years about saturated fats and animal fats. Long story short, he actually have, if anybody's interested on my website, I have notes that I've cropped out to show people what he's um, put in there. We did some specialized blood panel tests and I actually go to see him in two weeks. He has not seen me for six months. And I just had my new um, cardiac IQ panel done for him today, this morning. So we'll get to see what that is. My PCP, I saw him another time and he was a little less hesitant. And I saw him one other time after that. But the most recent visit I just had with him was the turning point. And I have to say, I'm extremely proud of him. He, my husband lost 27 pounds doing this. And um, this actually kind of plays into this. My husband had um, his bilateral crypt orchid when he was born. So his testes didn't drop. They ended up having to do surgery, but they waited too long to do it. And it caused some testicular tissue damage. So he's been, he's had hypogonadism for his entire life. You know, he's tall, very slender, does not put muscle on very well. And he actually had his testosterone checked recently and he was 250, right about that in 2017. And he just had it checked and he's 650 now, changing nothing. We thought we we're gonna have to give him some exogenous testosterone, but he's at like 60% higher than most males his age because he's 50. He's a bit older than I am. Anyways, the physician, the PCP, we had the same one. So we see the same one. He saw my husband's blood work is friggin' amazing. And he's seen my weight loss. And he came into the last appointment and he was just like proud as a peacock about my husband's blood work doing carnivore. And he actually sat down and looked at me. And he's like, what do you suggest? How do I broach the subject of weight loss with my other patients? Like he asked, he's like, how do people who, you know, 
don't have a lot of money. How can they eat this way? Like he was actually asking me questions. I'm like, he he's getting on board. Like he was super skeptical in the beginning, but now he's getting on board at least, at least with low carb keto. And I, I was just like, yes, because this doctor, there's no way he was at all going to suggest this when I started this. But I think he's seen that the work I put in, the improvements that both my husband, you know, he's older, he's never been obese to I'm younger, I have been obese. I, I think he sees a bit different body types that his eyes are now way wide open over this. Well, well I, that's commendable that, you know, because a lot of people are like, ah, I'm done with doctors. And I, I say, no, go back and, and, and prove them wrong and show them mm -hmm. and, you know, because we, you know, the, the doctors are getting their education largely from the pharmaceutical companies. I can tell you as a physician, all this, I just got my, you know, I just did all my, you know, a couple hundred hours of studying for CME for my, my license renewal and all of it, every one of it is a, is a pharmaceutical advertisement. It's just, you just read this stuff and roll your eyes and it's just drug, 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 drug. Uh, so good for you. It's good for you for, for sharing that and, 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 and meticulously documenting that stuff, because I think it's very important that we do that. You mentioned you were, you were diabetic, you know, full-blown diabetic. Do we have A1C comparisons? Do we know how that changed? Yes. My A1C was 7.1 when I started. Mm -hmm. And the last check, I believe it was 4.6. Don't quote me on it. It's like 4.6, 4.7. But I have all of that on, again, on my website, like I have everything on there so people can see, because that's the one thing people are like, oh, you're eating meat. You're going to be a type two diabetic. It's like, bruh. I already was a type two diabetic. I'm not anymore. And I'm wanting to, in the next couple of months to do like a, I think they dropped it down to three hour glucose test uh, because my physician pretty much with my insulin resistance now improved and things like that. He's like, you have reversed your type two diabetes is what he told me. Wonderful. You know, and it's interesting because you said you got a, you your 7.1 and actually, you know, the American College of Physicians is now recommending that type two diabetics maintain a blood glucose, uh, sorry, hemoglobin A1C between seven and eight, which is like, it's, it's insane to me that they're just saying that that's okay. Very that's high. normal. And that is clearly uh, going to contribute to heart disease, blindness, kidney disease, amputations, things like that. And now you have a blood glucose. It's better than 99% of the population, 4.6. I mean, you, yes. have, you have a clearly a non-diabetic hemoglobin A1C. And the other things, you know, because some of the critics will say that, well, you're just masking the symptoms. You haven't fixed diabetes. And what I often see, and I've seen this before, is, you know, the, the things we're worried about with diabetes, the, the, the blindness, the, you know, the retinopathy, the, you know, the, the vascular problems, those two get better with this. I've seen people reverse their diabetic retinopathy. I've seen people improve their cardiovascular system. I've seen them improve their renal system, you know, their, their, their uh, glomerular filtration rate actually recovers and improves. So it's more than just masking the symptoms. You're actually undoing and organ damage did you see any what let's just go through maybe if you're willing to share some other your your objective markers of improvement what do you what would you say has clearly gotten better for you and and how can you show that i will say with the diabetes i had actually started into having neuropathy symptoms in my feet mm -hmm. the sharp stabbing pains lord they were terrible um those have gone away I had um, hemosiderin staining starting in my feet. I don't know if everybody knows what it is, but that's just when the blood pools in the lower extremities too much and then it just gets pulled out of the bloodstream and it causes, if you've ever gone to Walmart and you've seen somebody and they wear shorts and you see like pretty much from the knee down, it's purpley red, that's hemosiderin staining. I had very mild of it. It's completely gone. I didn't think it would ever go away. My feet are completely cleared up. That was stupidly because it was just a cosmetic thing. But I was so pleased when I looked down one day, I'm like, hey, the spots on my feet and ankles are completely gone now. The biggest changes, honestly, have not been, they have been health-wise, but honestly, the biggest, biggest changes are mobility-wise. I went from having to use that walker, and I believe six weeks in, I was able to set the walker aside and stop using it. And I went from walking only a couple hundred feet, like, our mailbox is probably seven houses down, something like that. I would have to sit on the walker and huff and puff by the time I got there. I've been able to walk five miles. We you probably know where this is, Larrabee Park. The We've gone hiking at Larrabee Park. I can walk for a few hours without having to sit when before I couldn't stand more than a few minutes without having to sit down. The biggest change, and most people would find this too embarrassing to admit, but I really don't care. I struggle to wipe my own butt. 
I did. At 360 pounds, I struggled. It felt like I had to like almost dislocate my own arm to do it. The day that I did it without effort, I cried. The lowest point in my life is when I had to ask my husband to wash my butt because I couldn't do it. Like that in my entire life, that is the lowest moment of my life. And so these, these are the things that are the biggest improvements, I think. I mean, the health has been extraordinarily important, but these are the things that have pulled me out of my depression. I had gotten to the point with my anxiety and my depression that I wouldn't leave the house for months at a time. Like I had to stop seeing patients because I couldn't leave the house. Like I was so anxious, I would have panic attacks. And I'm on half my antidepressant now. Uh, I just haven't my doctor asked if I'd wait till the this time of year passes before I got all the way off of it. And I agreed. Uh, I take half my antidepressant now. I no longer suffer from anxiety. I haven't had a panic attack since I started this. And my husband had to listen every single night that I would just, well, complain I was in pain. But I would say, I wish I wouldn't wake up tomorrow. I was too afraid to honestly commit suicide. I had treated a patient when I lived in Minneapolis at the hospital that used a shotgun and she had failed, obviously, and I was too scared to do it. So I just wished my own body would quit on itself. And now I wake up excited for life and motivated. Yeah, that's that's so powerful. I mean, you're thinking you're in a situation where you're wishing to no longer be alive one way or the other (laughs) to... I mean, just to interview, you're happy, you're energetic, you're smiling. I mean, you know, you, you, you've gotten, I mean, life is now, you know, I guess, pleasurable again. And that's, and that's mm-hmm. so, so incredibly important. And, you know, I mean, to think about how many thousands, if not millions of people are in your very same situation. And, uh, you know, and many of them don't, most of them, in fact, don't, don't ever get out of that situation. And it's just, you know, take another pill, here's another thing. And, and, and it gets very frustrating Comparing yourself now to even a couple of years ago, quality of life wise, you know, there's people will say, well, this carnivore diet is unsustainable. It's not safe. It's, it's, it's going to cause you to have heart disease or something like that. What do you, what do you tell people when they say that? I mean, I mean, would you say, well, oh my gosh, I got, I've got a increased risk of heart disease. I better stop and go back to what I was eating or, or eat a balanced, you know, a balanced diet with fruits and vegetables and whole grains and lean meats and things like that, which I'm sure you already tried. Correct me if I'm wrong. Perhaps you didn't. But I suppose. I, have. I get comments like that on my channel all the time. Like, oh, you're going to, you're going to die of a heart attack or a stroke. And it's like, I was two steps away from that where I was at nine months ago. What are you, are you kidding me? And my comment always back is like, listen, I actually see a cardiologist versus regurgitating somebody else something somebody else told you. How about you go actually read the studies? I actually enjoy reading studies. And I remember, I don't remember which one of the heart studies it is, but I was reading through it and they completely removed an entire cohort. It was 60 year old plus because the LDL was higher, but their average length of life was longer. And because it didn't fit their hypothesis, they're like, ah, we're going to just take this data out. And once I literally read that in the study, I'm like, They've just manipulated the data to make what they want fit. And that's when I'm just like, my eyes were wide open. So I tell people, if, if you are genuinely concerned, I said, go read the studies. You may not understand, like if you don't have a medical background, there may be a lot you don't understand, but you will understand when you see them saying and admitting these things that they change the data, it, it's eye-opening. Yeah, there, I mean, yes. I mean, I, there's a lot of st- studies out there that, that if you look, you can find that that not everything mm-hmm. supports this, you know, this sort of diet heart hypothesis has been sort of prominent so far. What compelled you to, to be so eager to share this? There's some people that don't want the attention or they don't want, they, 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 you know, they're, they're embarrassed by this. And, you know, and I, you know, I, I can understand, you know, maybe you're, you're kind of vulnerable. You're showing yourself, Hey, here I am. I'm definitely not very healthy right now. Uh, you know, you've documented your, your journey. What, what compelled you to want to say, Hey, here world, look at me, look what I'm doing. I had lost my why to live. When I was treating patients, I loved working with stroke patients and neuro-based patients because I, through my skills, could they could go from being wheelchair bound to walking to going back to being about life. And then through the bureaucratic red tape of the medical community, it just sucked the life out of me. And I stopped enjoying it. And I had just literally stopped enjoying life because for me, 
What motivates me is to help people, to make tomorrow a better place than it is today. Like that is my goal in life. And I don't know what, like the light switch switched on, but I realized everything in life happens for a reason. We just may not see it for later on in life. And I used to question why, like, why me in the sense of like, why do I have to go through all this misery, you know, and all the suffering and all the whatever. And I just realized, you know what? I can take all that pain and suffering and share it with people because a lot of people, they just need one person to believe in them. They need one person rooting them on when they feel like the entire world is against them. They need one person. And I realized I can be that one person. I can get some responsibility for, you know, doing this for myself. But also I can be that one person that can show if I can do it, because I am no special person. I have really, really poor willpower, really poor willpower. You don't get 360 pounds having good willpower. If I can do it, then others can do it. And that that was my motivation. And that actually gave me my why back. There are very few people who are on YouTube that have shown it from the beginning. A lot of times it's the, I was fat and now I'm skinny. But there's so much in between that happens, the change, the lessons that we learn that I think are vital to share with other people. And honestly, I go back and look at my old videos frequently. If I'm feeling like down on myself or anything like that, I go back and look and I'm like, I was a completely different person. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. And I'm sure you are. Nine months in roughly, where do you go from here? What I mean, do you have some goals? I mean, do you have a, do you have a, like a target? Wait, are you going to go back to work as a physical therapist, or what do you? What do you? What do you? What does the future look like for you? You think? I, I still need to lose at least about another hundred, hundred and ten pounds. So I'm just at my halfway mark right now. <laughs> I can't imagine what life's going to look like in another, you know, six to nine months. My goal, I, I'm, I'm kind of done with physical therapy. I, when we moved up here, I actually didn't bring my license here. It just ten years burned out. I'm done. Honestly, my biggest goal is. I want to continue down this path of sharing my journey and trying to reach others that are suffering. My final like end goal is I want to be able to go in front of Congress. I want to be able to go demand the change. This is not okay. It is not okay to tell people like the American um, Diabetes Association had a recipe for pie up there with like half a cup of sugar in it. Why are you people telling them to eat sugar? Like, come on. Changes have to be made and people need to be willing to be the voice of opposition. And that is my goal is to be the voice of opposition. A big problem I have is there are two factions currently. You have the fat shaming people and you have the fat acceptance people. And when I mean fat shaming, I'm not saying like we need to say, oh, it's okay, you're you're fat. But it's like literally going up to a stranger saying you're fat or just being mean. That is just absolutely wild to me. But the fat acceptance is the same thing. Uh, These people like Tess Holiday blows my mind. I look at her, I'm like, I know. I know when you go to the bathroom, you you struggle to wipe your butt. I know you struggle with basic hygiene. Don't lie to people and tell them it is great being obese because it freaking sucks. And there's people like me in the middle that we are getting crushed by the fat shamers. Like you are not worth, you're not worth a human being. You're worth less than because you're fat. And then you have the fat acceptance that are like, how dare you try to lose weight? You're a terrible person. And then the average person in the center is getting squished. And it's not fair to get this pressure when you're just trying to improve yourself. And that, that is my voice. I'm the voice of the center. And that's what I continued, our plan to continue to keep doing. Yeah. Well, thanks for saying that because I, I've said this many, many times. I, I, I don't think anyone who, no matter what their condition is, should be, should be demonized or uh, you know, denigrated, but at the same time, we have to recognize that this isn't, this is illness and it comes with disease mm-hmm. and we should be striving to, to get these people out of uh, suffering because you, you mentioned it's yeah. not fun. It's, 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 it, in fact, it's quite miserable. Um, and so no one should be like encouraged to, 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 to either do that because I think you mm-hmm. see some young kids watching this and say, oh, it's okay to be obese. There's no big deal, right? They don't, they don't hear all the, I can't wipe my rear end and I'm in pain all the time and I can't walk and you know, I, I want to, I don't want to live and stuff like that. They're not being told that yeah. they're being told it's great and fine and, you know, good for you and girl power and all this stuff. And, you know, it's just, it, it, it is a problem. Let me ask you, cause we're, we're running out of time here. So you mentioned you have a website, you have a YouTube channel, 
and I, you know, I'd love to see where you're at in a year. Maybe we'll do this again next year and see, 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 see less of you again, a little, a little, bit, even less of you. And it'll be fun to see how you have you progressed over the, over the course of time. What, it, how do, how do people, uh, tell me what your YouTube channel is and where they find, I know I follow you on Twitter, but I don't yeah, know yeah. where else you are. That's fine. Uh, it's just at carnivorous underscore me is my YouTube. Mm -hmm. My website is just carnivorousme.com. Before I forget, I want to mention that we are actually doing a walking meetup like Padden tomorrow at 10 a.m. If anybody wants to join, you can literally just on my website, there's like just a little sign up so I know who's coming. We don't leave people behind. We are actually going to do monthly meetups and we're going to kind of oscillate between what I'd like to do is like do grilling outside at a park. And when it gets warmer, I'm actually want to do some events like paddleboarding. That was one of the first things that I did. That was so much fun. Mm -hmm. And I was still 300 and some pounds at that time. But if you fall, you fall in water. And I think, I think it would be fun for everybody. Uh, on Twitter, it's at carnivorousme1. And I actually have an Instagram, which is also at carnivorousme1. Well, wonderful. And I hope you uh, continue to share your message. And uh, like I said, I, I'll, I'll follow along and see how you're doing because it's, it's truly inspiring. And, and this is, you know, this is what, you know, I've been doing this now for, for many, many years now. And I, I'm just amazed at the number of people that have taken this up and are willing to share. And, and this is how it grows because it's not, it's not going to come from the corporation. It's not going to come from the government. Uh, it's got to be the people. It's got to be grassroots. And, you know, and, 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 you know, just as much as, as it's important to do scientific studies, these individual anecdotes and stories are incredibly powerful because there's not one, there's, there's literally thousands upon thousands of them. I mean, I've got a thousand on our website, thousand individuals. And you, there's very few places you can find a thousand testimonials. And we've already got that and, and more to come, uh, I'm sure, uh, every single day. Well, um, anything else we didn't get to talk on? Any other, any other words you want to share with us, Amanda, before we go? No, I will, yes, actually. I always tell people, if you are suffering and you are out there, I used to always think like these terrible things like my, wiping my butt, was just me. It's not. The, the suffering is out there and you are not alone. And there are always communities and people to reach out to. The one last thing I didn't mention was one of the biggest changes that I had was reading Jordan Peterson's 12 Rules for Life. That was huge for me because it helped me realize once I was able to accept the responsibility that I, Amanda, whether I have, I'm a binge eater or not, or an addict with sugar and carbs, it helped me accept responsibility. I chose to put that food in my mouth, but the power in that is if I chose, then I can choose something differently. Huge. So if anybody hasn't read that book, I strongly re recommend it. Hands down. Amazing. Yeah. I know there's a lot of several Jordan Peterson fans within the group here. And, and obviously, you know, he's doing a carnivore diet as well. I'm, as I'm sure you're aware, well of that, well aware of that. So anyway, well, thank you so much for, for sharing. And I, I continue to wish luck and Hopefully we'll run into each other in real life because, like you said, we're not. I'm, I think I'm maybe 40, 50 miles away from you, and uh, maybe I can get to one of those meetups at some point, depending on how the schedule goes. Um, for the rest of the folks, we have another one of these at 2 p.m. today. If anybody's interested, we have another guest, so uh, we'll keep doing what we're doing. Amanda, keep doing what you're doing. Keep spreading the word, being positive. You're a great role model and inspiration. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. You all have a lovely day. All right. Bye, guys. Take care. Hey folks, it's Dr. Sean Baker here. If you guys are enjoying these success stories, well, you can become your own success story. You can do that by heading over to carnivore.diet. You can sign up for a free 30-day trial and get started today. We're looking forward to supporting you. Our community is wonderful, and we'd love to see your success.